Hi everyone. I don't want to wade too deeply into the Covington Catholic School situation. It's been done to death on every channel and um, you know it's kind of an ongoing situation except to add an observation that I uh, that I made and I haven't seen brought up really anywhere else. And that's with respect to the broader activities and and attitudes of the left. I don't know what to call them. I mean, I think it would be a little bit of an affront to call it to call them the call them liberals because it's a bit of an affront to classical liberalism, I would say. I'll let you be the judge. I'm just going to call them the modern left because it does seem that a lot of the attitudes and the ideology has permeated the more mainstream of liberal culture or left culture. You can tell this when you've got people like Maxine Waters endorsing and condoning, uh, harassing people publicly for differences of, of opinion or uh, policy differences and that sort of thing. So just to, to clarify that, I'm going to call them the modern left. And that's the observation that I wanted to make here is the, the way that the modern left uh, conducts itself and an observation that I've made where there's some similarities between them and the Church of Scientology. So uh, I was aware, as uh, probably many of you are, of kind of the activities of the Church of Scientology long before Leah Remini's uh, series on A&E, where she sort of, you know, does a deep dive and exposes a lot of the, the policies of the Church and that sort of thing. And, but definitely her, her series has illuminated a lot of things that I wasn't aware of and has brought a lot of these things to the surface. And what I really like about that series is they back up a lot of the things that they're saying with actual policy documents signed by L. Ron Hubbard himself in a lot of cases from the church. So the church will, they will push back against some statements made by the people that appear on the show who are ex-church members. But what they never really seem to do is push back against the actual policy documents. They don't disavow any of that. And I think that's quite interesting. It's quite telling. In the Church of Scientology, and this is an observation that I've been making for a while, they have a policy against people who disagree with them, whether they're ex-church members or even people from outside, where if you disagree with them... Um, you know, you may ask for a debate, a discussion. You may challenge some notions and say, you as a church make these certain uh, assertions, but back them up. Show me where these things are true. They won't engage in any of that. They will just declare you a suppressive person. You are essentially deemed to be an enemy of the church at that point. A suppressive person is a pretty heavily weighted um uh, label for a person to have within the church. And they have within the church a doctrine of what they call fair game. The fair game doctrine was penned by L. Ron Hubbard himself. And the fair game doctrine basically essentially says that if someone is declared to be an enemy of the church, then any and all means necessary to discredit, destroy, just annihilate the person are deemed acceptable. This includes what would otherwise be unethical or illegal practices. All is okay, hence the term fair game. And they engage in these things. They engage in harassment. They have uh, policies where they attempt to get family and friends and neighbors to turn against the person. They try to destroy business relationships. They would love nothing more than destroy than to destroy your ability to earn an income and to have a business, a fruitful business. They have websites that they will put up about people and they'll have all kinds of slanderous accusations on the websites and they will make accusations that they can't possibly know or even probably know are not true in an attempt, again, to destroy a person's life. They call this fair game. Now, the observation that I've always made is the stated objectives of the Church of Scientology are to clear the planet. The idea being that when someone enters the Church of Scientology, they start to ascend this ladder of spiritual awakening. Now, it's really a ladder of contributions to the Church because every level that you attain or attempt to attain brings with it a ne uh, the necessity for a whole bunch of materials from the church that you have to purchase. These things are in the tens of thousands of dollars sometimes per level that these people attain. So it's not unheard of to hear people talk about having to have spent 250, 300, 400,000 dollars 
to work their way up the ladder and to buy all the course materials and then all the extra stuff that they wish you to buy. And then at some point they revise all the materials. So everyone has to buy them all over again. The idea being when you reach a certain level of spiritual att attainment, you will become a clear. As a person, you are clear. I, a clear of, I don't know what, anxiety and, and depression and all the, the negative parts, aspects, I guess, of being a human being. You are now a clear. You're determined to be clear. So, obviously then, the uh, goal of clearing the planet, the stated goal of clearing the planet, means we would all be this higher level beings, uh, free from all human, you know, detritus and all of that. Well, there's an obvious problem when you are constantly and continually declaring people as suppressive persons, as enemies of the church, how is it that you're going to clear the planet? You're creating an ever-growing population of people who are not going to be clear and how, who can't be clear. And they're not leaving the planet, so they're still here. And so I find it really ironic that the stated objective is to clear the planet, but of course they continually say this person is actually you know, unclearable. Uh, this person is irredeemable. And I see a lot of parallels between that and the modern left. And a great case in point is the Covington boys, because here we have some 16-year-old average boys who by anyone else's metric would be still on their way to maturity. We still mold and guide young people. And uh, if they show error in their ways, we want to help, help them along and show them the error of their ways. This is the reason we have juvenile um, judicial sort of systems rather than having everybody tried as an adult, for instance. And in fact, a lot of the people in the self-same modern left who would otherwise be touting justice reform and, um, and you know, treating people, uh, young people in particular and, and other people a lot better within the criminal justice system, they have seen these boys as their ideological enemy because of what they represent. They're white, they're male, they're probably mostly cisgendered. They were there protesting at a pro-life uh, march. And so this automatically makes them, in the eyes of the modern left, suppressive persons. And so when you have an incident like what happened um, with, the, with Nathan Phillips, there's no problem in, for the modern left in engaging in fair game ta tactics. They have called for the destruction of these boys. I mean, nothing seems to be off limits. Uh, one person had said something along the lines of uh, this person, meaning um, the, the young boy who was at the center of all of this, uh, has a bleak future and that's as it ought to be. A lot of people have rejoiced in the fact that these boys' lives will never be the same. Uh, some have obviously, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, have um, fantasized about putting them through wood chipper. All of them, all the MAGA boys go into the wood chipper, you know, and, they, and with, a, with an illustration uh, from like the Fargo movie, but with like an artist illustration of swirling red spray coming out of the uh, coming out of the wood chipper. Uh, obviously, Kathy Griffin, who has um, you know, she wants to dox these boys and and she wants to shame them. She wants them doxed. Why? Well, because they want to ruin their lives already. Of course, death threats and threats against the family and attempts to destroy business relationships have ensued, all because of this sin amongst these boys of being, um, well, they call them deplorables, but what they mean is redeemable, irredeemables, right? That's what they really mean. And I don't understand how it is, and, and of course, there's a cognitive dissonance that exists in people that are dogmatic because they develop narratives, the narratives service a ideology, and they don't question their own ideology. So much in the same way that you do not engage in any kind of debate with the church, you either toe the line or you are a suppressive person. And there's no in-between. There's no negotiation. It's the very same with the modern left. They're not interested in debate. They do not want to have their ideas challenged. They do not want to have to um, justify their ideas. The narrative is the narrative. And if you don't comply, you are an irredeemable and you are subject to fair game in their eyes. Now, Again, when it comes to the claims made, 
there's an incongruity there because the claims made by the modern left is that they're about diversity, they're about inclusion, they're about equality. Well, all of these deplorables, all of these irredeemables don't go anywhere. When you declare them, they don't leave the planet. They're still here and they vote and et cetera, et cetera. So destroying their lives, getting them fired from, them, from their jobs, making their lives difficult and uh, harassing them and all of that doesn't remove them from the planet. They're not gone. So how is it that you're going to ever reach this goal of yours of inclusivity and diversity and equality? And for those things to be worthwhile, they must necessarily include the people that you are relegating to the scrap heap of humanity, declaring as deplorables and irredeemables. Uh, otherwise, there's equality with what? You know, inclusion of who? Diversity of who, right? It must necessarily include everyone. And a compassionate person would say, I disagree with you. Let us engage in discourse. Let us find the true differences that we share and find if we cannot come to some common ground. Let's embrace one another, my brother, as people who have to share this planet together, etc., etc. There's none of that with the modern left. And the evidence of this, of course, comes in the, in, in the form of the fact that the narrative was at first, these boys, how dare these boys mock this, this elder. And the, the narrative of privilege has taken a real beating over this, uh, except that it hasn't, right? Because the progressive stack has moved along. The progressive stack once upon a time was, you know, if you were at a at some sort of a gathering and there are minority women of color or people, you know, with the with all of the intersections there, then and if you're there as a straight white male, you ought to remove yourself from the podium and allow the people who have traditionally been oppressed, the people who meet all the intersectional uh, characteristics, let them have the podium. But that has morphed. You know, the left like to sort of rail against conservatives for, for talking about slippery slopes with regards to lots of things that the left wanted, you know, gay marriage and, and, um, and abortion and different things like that. And they said, ah, this slippery slope arguments are all bullshit. Well, they're not necessarily. I mean, the, the progressive stack is a good example of that. You've seen it go from this, where it should be kind of a voluntary, you let the people, the traditionally historically oppressed people speak first, to now it's kind of just automatic. If there is a confrontation between a young white male and an elderly um, uh, minority native uh, elder or something like that, we just believe the native elder first. And the young white cisgendered Catholic male is obviously garbage. Like that's what the progressive stack has become. And, the, and again, the problem is there's no compassion within these people. You can tell because the narrative took a bit of a beating because obviously they weren't, uh, they didn't surround and swarm this guy. They weren't there wanting to rip him apart as he said. When the fuller picture came out, it became obvious that the narratives were all screwed up as to what took place here. So people, instead of, by and large, um, some people apologized, some people retracted, a lot of tweets disappeared. Cowards, I would say. Don't make the tweet disappear. Apologize as a subtweet to that and retweet it and, and, and stand on your word because I think you can only truly grow if you admit your faults publicly. If you're going to be so brazen as to make public attacks like that about punching people and everything else, you ought, to, you ought to stick with them. But what these people did, a lot of them, was they just doubled down. They just looked for it. It's got to be there, right? This is a suppressive person. So we're going to engage in fair game. We're going to analyze every aspect of their lives. We're going to look for symbols that we think are uh, symbolic of uh, white supremacy and racism. And we're going to, aha, see, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, the beatdown just continues. These people have not let up. And I think it's just indicative of the fact that they are engaging in a practice of fair game, just like the Church of Scientology does. And that, that policy, that doctrine, is counter to their stated objectives of diversity, inclusion, and equality, or clearing the planet. And it just exposes the fact that these people are not about those stated objectives. They're all about power. Let me know what you think. Thanks as always for watching.